Hello, welcome to Jade Kind Gaming. My name is Adam, here with another actually building the world video uh, after a while. And this one's going over notes and uh, ideas I've come up with, as they all do. Um, and I think a lot of what I've successfully focused on since last I made one of these has been like the origin of the world and um, at least somewhat of the deities. Not necessarily names of many of them or details, but like what the like the primary like focus level of deity, like what their gods over. Um, so things like that I've definitely come up with a lot of. Now, that was not what I was thinking that this episode of actually building a world was going to be. I thought this was going to be the one on, on the map, and it was exciting. So I, I put some work into building a map. Awesome. I don't like it. And it took a lot of work. Um... To the extent of, like, I made, like, climate classifications to figure out what type of climate is where in the world. Um, all science or science-adjacent stuff following guidelines and inspiration from Artifexian, a YouTube channel I follow. And in the end... Following the idea of here's, you know, going from tectonic plates and here's what happened. And I'll go over all of it when I do make a video on it. But in the end, I ended up with that map and I didn't like it. I, I didn't get the climates in the areas I wanted to, in the quantities or amounts I wanted. I didn't, I didn't get the things I wanted for the story I wanted to tell. Now, I learned a lot while doing it um, and have some ideas of how I could almost force enough of the kind of climates I want where I want them. Um, so all I have to do is redo it. But it, it was days of work. Like two or three eight plus hour days of just working on a map. It's coming up, you know, coming up with some ideas, all that beforehand, and then just going through and doing the art and the pseudoscience to place the climates. So I got discouraged. And so I haven't worked on the map. I worked on it about two months after making that map. Uh, just to kind of figure out an idea of what I wanted. I have a replacement continent for one of them, and I'm moving some of the other continents around. It's been about three more months since I did that, and I still haven't had the motivation or energy to get back into working on that map. And that's fine. That's, that's the thing. With world building, don't, don't force yourself to do an ad. There there's so much to world building. I wanted to do it because I wanted that to be the next video. Oh, well. I even have that map up on the um, World Anvil page because right when I made it, I was excited and I put it up. And it wasn't until I spent a day or two looking at it and trying to figure out, okay, where is what nation and culture that I have in my notes going to be? And I'm like... No. They don't they don't fit here. They don't belong here. I didn't have a space for them. And I was upset. But there is, as I said, so much to world building. While I haven't had motivation to work on that, I have had so many ideas come to me. Um days spent um writing notes and then typing them up. As I just sit there and and the thoughts come for other aspects of world building. Yeah, it's not the thing I wanted for this video. So this video changed. Oh well. When you're when you're world building, don't force your I, I, I at least try not to and would encourage others, don't force yourself to work on an aspect of it that isn't fun for you. Especially, you know, whatever, it'll all be fun for you at some point, right? It just takes that inspiration to hit. And I loved working on the map when I was doing it. It was a lot of work, but I was learning so much and it should be easier when I finally get the motivation to go back to it. But 
we're going to just delve into, uh, I didn't even get the current notes, um, into, like, World Anvil or anything. I just have them in a document here, um, really at the bottom of a document of all the stuff that I've gone over previous times. Just here, new stuff. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if I may read, and I'll talk as I go, because I'm me, uh, language is where I started here, yep. If I say all languages are unique, uh, then sense is lost. As I am making um, the words from my own Earth-based perspective, so some level of foundation is needed. I think, and I say here, ancient elven, a dead language, and I'll get to that after the paragraph, is basically Latin. Also, one of the languages common in one of the continent one nations, so probably either the pro or anti-magic faction, um, one of those languages uh, is basically English just renamed. Um, which obviously I'm going to play completely in English, regardless of what nation is talking. But as far as naming like proper nouns, um, you know, of course with English, you get uh, certain names of locations where like uh, it's easier for me to pick ones of like Spanish. With Spanish, you get Los Angeles. The Angels is what it means if you're speaking Spanish. Um, so just having the language like some places are just named things. And that's fine. So have English be one. Um, and doing this lets me start by naming the world and using Latin as a base to diverge from. So for now, and uh, it's, again, I've been writing this over like the last five plus months because I was gonna have this either with or after the doing the world building stuff and that's been months because I thought I would get back to it sooner and at this point I'm just changing videos because I haven't. Um, so I've been happy with this name for months. Uh, the world is Amotra. Um, coming from Amotara I think it's like love of world, whatever, a motra. Uh, and it says here, also means likely the elves were the first with a written language. And from some of the stuff that we'll get to, you'll understand why I don't think that's going to be ancient elven. Maybe it's ancient human. Um, and maybe it just has a name. Maybe I give it a proper name because I don't want my languages to be race-based. That's one of the things I want to get away with, with building a large complex world, is the idea that this race all speaks the same language. That's not how worlds work. That's silly. <laughs> but that's how D&D &D works, because it's easy. And then, and so that's my language. Person. And then I, I move on to this next note. And this next note, I particularly find interesting, because it's not having developed anything. It is just purely looking at the process of my mind going from do to do everyday life to I have an idea. And I tell myself, listen to Polywog in a Bog for inspiration. It's a song. Ooh, I should have looked it up first. Is it, is it Bare Naked Ladies? Maybe? I'm not positive. Um, but it's a song, and it's a silly song. Um, Make amphibian race, uh, which can use an amount of downtime to change racial stats, or begin the game tadpole form and eventually become frog form, like maybe each level gained for the first like five levels. Uh, each feature has two options, and uh, you can replace one each time. Um, so you're slowly changing traits, uh, maybe going from uh, being able to uh, breathe uh, under water to gaining uh, frog jump, whatever. Uh, but basically your race changes as you advance and go from polywog to frog. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know like the details or what that entails, but I was listening to music and an idea, I was like, because the song talks about, like, changing from a tadpole to a frog. Um, <laughs> it's a silly song. I like silly songs. Um, 
But I was like, that, that's an interesting concept. Um, I then write a separate note. It just says X Hayward. I think it was a class or subclass idea, and I was pretty confident when I typed it that if I just wrote that one word, I would remember what I meant. I don't. So sometimes I end up with things in my notes that I'm like, maybe eventually I will connect this with the memory of when I first came up with the idea. But it is uh, also there as an encouragement for me to take good notes when I write notes for myself because I don't always remember things. So that may end up being lost and never used because I don't know what I meant when I wrote that note. Um, I uh, revisited the elf human origin story. Um, make it stream of life, stream of um, knowledge instead of tree or fruit. So being drunk from the stream uh, and there are three tribes. One from life became elves, one from knowledge became humans third one did not arrive until the source of the streams had become blocked off and they became the orcs. Um, and from that idea, I start what is... And I'll have little notes throughout here where I talk about my ideas coming up with it, but I have some almost prose, some in-world story, some these are the origins of the world. Whatever church or god keeps scripture of history, of knowledge of what was, you know, of how the world came to be, this is kind of written as their notes on that. At the start of all things was the first god, the original creator, known to us as Primoris, from the ancient elven tongue, again tying back to that Latin, whatever, this can be adjusted as that's adjusted. And Primoris sang out in the dark void and created the world and far more. Sang because uh, our world was spoken by God in Tolkien's world, I believe, and I know in Narnia, Aslan, those worlds were sung. Well, the thing that those have in common is they have magic. So world with magic was sung, so I stuck with that. This, Our world is sung into being. Um, and I even go further into that, like that's, but that's where that came from. So, uh, created the world and far more, uh, from the grass that grows alongside the brook, to the stars in the night sky, the world itself was sung into being, and that tune echoes on today and can be manipulated in the grand art we collectively call magic. Primoris gazed upon the creation and decided it would be a fitting gift to bestow upon their children. But Primoris had no children around to give it to. Primoris resolved to rectify this, and gathered the dust of stars together and formed it into the likeness of a man, Stella. They then reached into the noonday sun and pulled out flame to form Stella's sister, Ignis. Then they gathered earth from the land and water from the sea to make a beautiful woman of clay, Krita. Primoris hummed a tune in the ears of the figures they'd created, and the siblings were brought to life with that knowledge of a tune to create, and were gifted a motra, a world to create in so, to create in so long as they got along. Setting up plot point, eh? Uh, <laughs> so as a note to the process, uh, basic idea was already in my head from uh, time about out and about, uh, but then I sat down to flush it out, and the above paragraph still took about an hour. So I had already come up with the idea of how I wanted this beginning to go, and it took me about an hour to still write it out and arrange it into this idea of prose, what sounds like good for in-world writing. Uh, this sets up for a story of them fracturing. Yeah, it sets up for a story of them fracturing and eventually fighting, and Primoris pulling them back uh, into the cosmos, dark void, uh, not to directly interfere any longer. Uh, before that, they create mankind, and likely another of them messes with the tribes of mankind to make the human elf orc distinction. They also create the gods that will be the standard uh, gods of the world.
And it is in their anger at each other that they create the devils, evil gods as well. And then once they are pulled back to the cosmos, the remaining gods choose to fix the problem, uh, now left the, to their own, by pulling back as well uh, to keep the devils, evil gods back with them. Uh, but not wanting to truly leave as the siblings did and not being forced to by anyone above them, uh, they create the heavens and hells, uh, and as long as they remain in the heavens, the devils, evil gods are stuck in the hells as well. Um, then the story of creating the next line of lesser divines that can venture out uh, from them, as well as creation of angels and demons and such. Also reference creation of other races at some point and of animals either under first creation or given to one of the siblings to do, uh, perhaps the one not involved in creating or altering mankind. Now you're going to see that note. When I wrote the above paragraph, I was like, oh, I took an hour just to do this. I then wrote this note that is not prose that will inspire some of the stuff you're about to see. So it's a rough idea of just write a note here. Now let's flesh it out and decide what it all means. Um, so, further note on process. A fair bit of the ideas towards this have come to me at church. Actually, that's true. During worship, um, and I just have to try and remember them until I get home. As far as concept-based ideas, perhaps Stella, Soul, Ignis, Spirit, Krita, Body, um, as a rough idea to guide personality, um, for the small bit I need for these sibling deities. Just enough to give them a bit of a personality, I just tied them into those soul, spirit, and body concepts. Um, a detail that can be removed once the story written. So I don't need that. Like, it doesn't have to be called out like, oh, this is representative of this. But as far as giving me a mindset, I had to come up with a real quick, you know... Like, if you have a distinction of rock, paper, scissors in your mind, you could have done the same thing with assigning each of them that kind of personality of just some way to distinction them around each other. So, picking up from the above prose, the siblings brought to li uh, life to Amotra. Uh, from the fish of the sea to the birds of the sky and a multitude of creatures to live upon the land. They each created a wide variety of creatures of sizes, both great and small, to inhabit Amotra. Krita first sought to create a grander creature, one with ambition and creativity of its own, and she brought mankind into being. From this, Ignis was inspired and bestowed the same gifts upon stout statues of stone and metal, creating the dwarfs under the earth. Stella on the other hand, thought it better to make improvements to his sister's creation. He carved into a mountainside that it may give forth to two springs, and he invited mankind to come and partake of a drink. Those who chose to drink of the stream of life ceased aging and were not subject to the entropy of time. They became known as the elves. To those who drank of the stream of knowledge, they gained an awareness and uncommon grasp of new skills, and they, they became known as humans. But Stella grew bored and stopped the springs to move on, while some of mankind was still on their journey to the springs, and the tribes that formed from those who arrived too late for the blessing grew bitter, and we now call them the Orcs. Krita saw what her brother had done to her creation, altering some angering others, and she was displeased. She schemed a new creation, more solitary and grand, that would be harder to influence and distort. So I'm, I guess I'm already starting to see the, the threads of discord amongst some of the siblings, where they're not doing what they want the, each other to do. They're siblings. <laughs> Uh, so from here, continue with she... Uh, so, um, so here I got to this point in my notes. I left myself more notes to use later. From here, continue as she creates the first of the next lower level of divine beings. Uh, things like time and death, perhaps, early. Uh, ultimately, gods created and eventually devils, evil gods, as the conflict increases between the siblings. And some of them have n having new races created alongside the divine beings. 
<coughs> have a god of words, uh, Liber, possible name, uh, written and spoken. Uh, the power that words contain when put out into the world. Another thing, inspiration that came to me while at church. Um, separate account of history, uh, perhaps from scripture of the god of nature, can tell the story of what was created by Primoris, where the story glances over things, and maybe what animals were created by the siblings. Because if you notice, like I, my first note, I was like, oh, go over, they create these animals. But I didn't detail what animal was created by who, or how any of that worked, and, and like nature was just all created by Primoris at once. No detail in any of it. Just glossed over. But the idea of different scriptures, so eventually I might write the scripture from, like I say, God of Nature. And the God of Nature might have an origin in the world that pays a lot more attention to, you know, the, the animals and the different plants and just things like that. Things that um, are glossed over in this, so I can I can revisit the story in another uh, another aspect later, I guess. Um, oh, and here I jump out of this like I'm going through all this stuff on origin of the world, and I jump out of it completely because I had another idea. And I'll get back to the origin of the world like it's already on the screen. I need an ability to allow a bard to summon their instrument like an eldritch knight can summon their weapon. Allowing them to, say, drop their piano on a space on the battlefield and play piano as their bardic instrument. Because I'm thinking, like, man, the biggest thing, the biggest issue with, with bards playing their instrument is they're limited to all these handheld things. Ugh. How can we stop that? Well, if you have an eldritch instrument that you can summon forth, even if it has to be set up somewhere, you're in the middle of the woods, call forth your piano. <laughs> Um, and here is an idea that changed my concept from music in the world to something I love a lot better. Because also there's no reason why we have to have archaic instruments. Why not have bards with guitars? And on that note, if the world has magic batteries to power magic items, which is one of the things I want this world to have, it's like one of the concepts, I even talk about it, ideas for it later, um, why can't we pop one of those into the back of a guitar to amplify it and make ourselves an electric guitar allowing real like rock music from our bards yeah I like a, a good fantasy but I love I like modern music too um is it a knight's tale mm. like that kind of concept like there's no, no reason why we can't have that kind of you know rock musical in our fantasy setting like mm, love it um, and think of a bard that has the ability, uh, that the weaker willed around them joins in on a dance, big musical dance number style. Like, just an idea for one of a, a bard subclass, like, what if I want to have musical performance bard? What if I want to have, force those weak willed to just join in and create a musical number in the streets where, where, where everyone is involved in song and dance? Right? Isn't that fun? Wouldn't that just be fun? I like musicals, so. <laughs> um, so. Then I get back into the origin of the world. And I have a note here. The follow I, I wrote this afterwards. The following was written over about six hours in one afternoon. I pulled up the list of the races I needed for the world. I pulled up... Uh, a list of creature types that would need to exist. Aberration, fey, dragon, all, all that kind of thing. Giant, like the different creature types in 5th edition D&D. And the 3.5 deities and demigods list of pantheons, just for inspiration. And I spent my day imagining and writing while just listening to music. I just threw on some music uh, on Spotify, and I sat on that table behind me that... There. there we go. It's a mirror. So I sat like right there and spent like six hours coming up with the following chunk of world. And I don't have names for the, the deities that come up here. And I don't have genders for 
most or all of them. Obviously, I did for the first four. Um, Primoris, I just didn't assign a gender to. They're just they. They're so far back and so little known that even if they have one themselves, it's not that the people of the world would know it, so they don't associate one. Um, and then I give a, a brother and two sisters. So. <clears throat> Krita created... Blank. The God of Time... Uh, to count the hours left for those whose days were numbered, and the god of death to care for them once they'd passed on, as well as the planes for them to work in within the outer barriers of the world. So that is, Krita is picking up trying to take care of um, the humans. They're going to die. Their time is numbered, and they will die. Because they didn't so that's what this is. We're picking up from that part of the story. Stella followed suit by, pre by creating a god of learning to guide the humans called by the river of knowledge and a god of beauty to guide the elves born of the river of life. So we still have these siblings kind of fighting over how they're interacting with things. Um, Ignis followed in the path of her siblings but wishing the confrontation to end, she created the god of love to set an example of how to treat each other, and Libru, the god of words, to further communication as a goal. You can already see some of these personalities just showing up here. And the years on Amotra moved on. Time slipping by for the land's mortal inhabitants far more than the gods above, and as sands of time ran out and God of Time handed our glass to God of Death, one after another, they learned far more from God of Love's example than Stella or Krita ever did. This is tying that I had an idea, I don't know, probably the first time I went over just my notes of this idea of time watching over hourglasses, particularly with things like this, like the idea of an elf's hourglass not having, like, a hole for sand to drain out. Um, so it's, you know, until the glass is broken, death, by some other force, it doesn't run out on its own. Um, but humans, time running out, and that kind of, like, different, like, mindsets of time for different races and things. I had this idea, and then, like, almost like a, a window... Where, where time would hand souls to death and they'd have these brief interactions and would yearn for the day when all time had ran out and they can truly just be together. Just sort of forming this, un, un, you know, this love where they can't, they don't have the time to really focus on each other. They have work to do and they both value their work. Anyways, that was an idea I had ages ago, but I'm now tying that into my world origin, like right near the beginning. When there's almost no gods, they're already falling in love. Krita looked back across the land and saw where mankind was headed. And she created God of Civilization. Ignis wanted to steer people in a positive direction as they gathered together, so she created God of Family. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Stella looked to further ingratiate himself to the people he'd altered, so he created God of the Craft to inspire humans who'd spread across the land and God of Nature to bless the elves who'd taken to separate themselves in natural places. So we're getting very traditional elves here, um, common mindsets of people, but even just things like one creates civilization while the other creates family. Like, where, what focus? Things that can be very intertwined, but where is the focus and is it beneficial or uh, is it just... Is the god being led by the mankind, or mankind being led by the god? 
anyway, so just different personalities within the gods as they create more of these lesser gods that will eventually be the main gods that stay within the outer planes. Um, Krita observed so many of her people forsaking her for her brother, and it made her angry. When the orcs beseeched her for a god to guide them, she created for them the god of warfare. But as she'd done so as an act of anger, the devil of bloodshed was born into creation as well. Devil's born accidentally. Ooh. Working in malice. I don't know. I just... Mm, I like it. It's my own idea, but it's one that I've done months ago, and I like it. <laughs> Which is good. When you read back on your stuff from months later, and you're like, oh, that... I was clever. Th that means you've created something that you'll probably be long-term happy with as forming a world. Um, Ignis was saddened by the bitter fighting that her siblings um, were now spreading uh, to the peoples of Amotra, and she created the god of nobility, that the leaders may help guide the people through these hardships, and still, the dwarves dwelled on their in their mountain homes. It's been a while since we've talked about dwarves, and I was like, as I, as I started going through, eventually I was like, at some point I need to bring up, they still exist. But the idea is the dwarves are, like, all this is going on between mankind and division, and it's going to get worse. But at some point before it gets too bad, I wanted to just point out, dwarves are still around, dwarves are deep in the mountains, and they're separate from society. Because I, they're just, they're split. They're... All, so many of these gods are like clearly like harking on the different things of mankind. Not that dwarves are completely divided from them, but they're just in their own area. So I, I brought that up again. Um, Stella sought to cause chaos as a response to his sister, uh, Krita's jealousy. And as such, he created the god of trickery. But with the creation being done out of malice, a devil of chaos came into being alongside that creation too. And this devil was truly an agent of chaos who shattered the world as it broke out of the natural universe through the outer barriers and became lost to our knowledge. Here, I have created a devil that isn't named and doesn't exist in the world. But I have already established a creating something for wrong reasons can create a devil. And I wanted to... And I've also kind of tied that it may be that devil is somewhat tied thematically. War, bloodshed, so now trickery, chaos. Okay? And chaos can just shatter through. So we've broken through the world. Now, now what happens from that? Stella looked at the mess caused by his actions, and he felt shame. He sought to set things right, but was too fearful to risk creating another god. Instead, working to fix the hole where the lost typo, uh, devil had broken from the world, uh, he patched it with four copies of the world itself made from the world's natural elements, air, earth, fire, and water. But the world's outer barrier, where the time plane and death plane were located, was fractured all around them. Worse yet, strange aberrations from, the outside, cre from outside of creation had seeped into the world before the hole was patched. In a panic, Stella created great creatures to fend off these aberrations. The great giants and mighty dragons. So here we have Stella, a, one of the upper gods, afraid to use their own creation. They're not willing to make something as powerful as another another god. They, they're like, oh no, that messed things up. So they echo the world itself. Um, and we get our elemental planes. Because I want those elemental planes all to be echoes. And then they create, and then they notice, like, the things that have come up. Like, they're trying to fix their problems and not doing so in the best way. 
uh, because they're acting out of fear. And so they create giants and dragons. Big, mighty creatures. But not at the level of another god. Still like creating another animal, which they, we know they've done many times. Or sapient race, which has been, certainly been done and established. Not, nothing bad has happened, but creating something as big as a god, we've now seen a couple times, can create a devil. And, oh, they didn't want to risk another issue. So they create mortal creatures to fight against these aberrations which as you may expect long term giants and dragons might end up being a problem for you know the other races on the world but that creates some of those 5e creature types that i need in this world i got aberrations giants and dragons in the world check okay um in this time uh the gods learned the deeper power and control they had in the newly broken open outer barrier. This is, and I, maybe I need to word it differently. This is the 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 gods, the um, god of family, god of civilization. Th those level gods um, are learning the deeper power and control that they had in the newly broken open outer barrier, uh, and made homes and play spaces of their own in the shattered bits of the realm. So note, uh, here is where God of Trickery makes the fae. Okay, so I am not saying in this story anywhere where fae come in. Now maybe God of Trickery's version of the story might mention it. Um, but I am noting here, we get Outer Plains, God of Trickery is making Wonderland, or whatever. Um, and fae are being created in that outer realm. Um, so that is where fake coming is is through this other world but it's not being done necessarily strictly on the material plane so i'm not mentioning it in this story but i make a note for it and also this is just where all the gods get whatever their outer realm worlds are two of them were already made with the gods all these other ones these are gods walking up among mankind on the earth now they're like oh we have aspects of creation much like our creators if we go to the outer realms here the outer barrier even to make it work for outer yeah outer planes etc so now they're getting their own planes they're figuring that out ignis wept at the problems her siblings were creating and she made the god of sorrows to comfort herself once she'd had time needed time to compose herself she moved onward to fix what she could and as such, she bestowed upon the gods she'd created the ability to create angels to send across the world to help as they were able. Furthermore, seeing how much of the fighting was over and causing harm to the mortals of Amotra, she expanded their numbers, creating gnomes, little people who could go about below the observation of many and Merfolk, who could hide away beneath the waves as her dwarves had still been able to do under their mountains. Note, dwarves mentioned again, they're still hiding away. They're still under the mountains. Now we get Merfolk under the waves, and we get gnomes. Gnomes have been introduced. So two new races that are not mankind. So far, we have uh, dwarfs not mankind, then we had mankind. Elves, orcs, humans, all three considered mankind. Thus, we get the half-elves and the half-orcs. So, Krita, on the other hand, mocked her brother's fear of making more gods simply due to the devil that had sprung forth. So, now, Krita had made the first devil. No remorse there. Um, and she created a shadow realm in perversion of his elemental planes, the underworld, where undeath called home. Uh, and from this action, the devil of fear was born into the world. Now, here we have um, something being made that isn't another god, and a devil is born from it. But she's doing it in ill intent. She's doing it mocking her brother's fear, so we get the devil of fear. Um, and she's creating underworld, so I get that fifth shot. Like, um duplicate world that matches the material plane 
because I wanted each of the elemental planes and the underworld to be all, which is like un undeath place, place with ghosts and all that kind of things. Just thematically, I wanted those to each be areas that were shadows, that were um, mirrors of the material plane. So now we have all those. Great. I, I've, I'm, I'm literally checking off boxes as I'm coming up with this story sitting at the uh, table over there. It's a mirror. <laughs> um, moving further, she created the God of Arcane to open opportunities for mortals to seek powers of their own beyond control of the gods. She's literally trying to make it where the mortals cannot be controlled by the gods they've created, possibly even herself. She's just... And from this, the devil of madness crawled from her mind. This is really Krita just going mad with... She doesn't like what happened, so... If she doesn't get to be happy, nobody gets to be happy kind of mindset. Um, going back to Ignis. Ignis continued proliferating peoples making little giants among men and the kobolds from dragons doing what she could to redeem her brother's hasty creations giants and dragons were made oh no let's make races of men based on them so little giants being like the furbolg and the goliaths and those kind of things and of course the kobolds so Expanding that and pulling proper races from those, as it were. Um, she provided that the gnomes may find companionship with mankind, bearing halflings. I have made halflings into half gnomes. Whoops. Sorry. Not sorry. Uh, but that also ties those two races into basically being, again, tied through with mankind. Uh, and she let that the genies who made their homes in the elemental planes could lay with mankind and from them be born the elemental plane touched. Likewise she permitted that her own angels may bear Asimar alongside mankind. So now we have the whatever the Genasi and Asimar uh, we have also established genies are in the elemental planes, which also ties in we have elementals in those elemental planes. That creature type is check. Um, and, and we're just continuing to explore the different, just why are there so many different races on this world? It is literally one of the gods is trying to create new options so that living in a world that is currently under a barrage of gods and devils living on it still is trying to make a way that life finds a way um so where were we here uh, uh krita spat at her sister's efforts and mocked her creations by making the races of goblinoid in a a uh, perverse reflection of mankind's original division. Um, as in goblin, hobgoblin, bugbear for orc, elf, human, whichever one matches with which one I don't know, but that's the idea. Um, and her act of creation gave birth to the devil of pain. At this point, any act that that Krita has made so many devils and is embraced that so much that anything she's creating is just causing more devils to spew forth. Um, so she's trying to hurt uh, her sister's feelings, so pain devil is made. Uh, with a further desire to twist her sister's efforts with angels, she allowed that the devils that were born from her malice could create demons and lesser devils of their own. Furthermore, she too set them loose to breed amongst mankind that typhlings may be born from their union. And through her actions, the devil of lust was created. Won't go too detailed in there. <laughs> 
Stella looked on helplessly at the mess that he blamed himself for starting, and saw with terror that the loose aberrations from beyond were altering mankind themselves. Oh, these creatures that have just shown up, still going around, they have been messing with mankind. We get our psychic race, the, the gif and whatever, the psychic races. Now, that's where those come from. Opening minds to create new species from them. He beseeched Ignis to resolve this in his stead. He doesn't want to do anything. He, he has lost all will to act on his own. So he goes to his sister that has been trying to fix things and just points out the problem is like, you fix it. Ignis agreed and created the God of Binding. That a stop was put to the Aberration's efforts. And they instead sought rank amongst Devil of Madness as lieutenants of his... Question mark, because again, I don't have genders assigned to these devils or gods or anything. Demons. So we have literally one of the devils, in, in addition to being able to make demons, they have the aberrations working under them. Primoris glanced once more at Amotra. So all this has been going on, and Primoris, being at a different level of what time is, looks back. All this has happened on the world's scale of time, and it's just a glance back to observe how their children were getting along, and was disappointed. They instructed the trio of siblings that it was time to move on. Pulling Krita from the world by her arm, Krita's been making all the mess, while Stella followed with his head hung in shame, Ignis looked upon Amotra one last time with fervent hope that her gods could bring enough order to the world that its people could carve for themselves peaceful lives. <sighs> uh, following this, God of Binding works to bind gods and devils into outer barrier realms. Uh, at some point, the God of Family is approached uh, once some dwarves leave mountains to allow half dwarves. So, half dwarves are like what we think of in idea of what normal dwarves are. Uh, dwarves in this world are literally made of the elements. Uh, I think I've gone over that before, but... Um, so I have little further notes, and I don't get to making those notes. Those notes haven't been done yet. But, like before, I make notes once I finish up, like wherever I am, of here's what comes next. But I haven't figured out how I'm writing it. So that's, that's where I'm at with that. So following that, Ignis's gods... Love, words, family, nobility, sorrows, binding, can create angels, Krita's devils, bloodshed, fear, madness, pain, lust, can create demons. Uh, Krita also had gods, time, death, civilization, warfare, arcane, and Stella had gods, learning, beauty, craft, nature, and trickery, all of which likely need some forces to interact with the world, uh, though likely far less numerous. So they won't have devils or angels, but they'll have... Like, I'm sure Kraft will have things that are like uh, Modrin, essentially, or whatever. Um, now, there are some reasons I noted this for myself, because I want a note of who's got what. Because Ignis's gods are basically, we got our real, like, our good. Um, which, I, which, is, which is particularly fun for me for certain things. Um, like nobility. Let's use nobility as our example. Obviously, people are involved. So... There are nobles that are people. And I like the idea of this, like, nobility being a positive thing, gifted to the world. But once people are involved, they may take this scriptures that the god of nobility has, and perhaps you can go read it, and you see all the good things, and then as a player, they hear certain bits of that scripture added into speeches that nobles give, you know, to their subjects and such, and just, like, cherry-picking verses, um, which is terrible, but what people do and you know to further their own gains so the idea that nobility would not choose the verses about what their responsibility like what they're there for but what they are owed is of course things that they're going to bring attention to um the idea of sorrows being one of the good god because it's not 
Like, if you look below, the devil of pain. Pain and sorrow can often be confused, but the idea that one is... Like, it is good to see things that are bad and to feel sorrow. That's not a problem. But sorrow is created to move onward, to compose oneself. It didn't took time, even for the god doing it. Ignis took time. I don't know. Um, and then binding. Binding is a weird one. Binding is specific, but binding is, one, really tied into that next point of keeping gods and devils from directly interacting. We want them in the outer planes. Um, and also just things like keeping one's word is under god of binding. Um, and so I might have some things with that. Um, uh, under the devils, uh, particularly lust was late. See, that god originally where that was written, it was the devil of evil. Which, I mean, it's like, these are all evil. What are you talking about? They're, they're devils. Of course they're evil. But it's what came to mind. And I wasn't going to have one for lust. Like, lust could, whatever, it, some aspects would fall under evil, sure. Um, perhaps some could be, like, nobility gets perverted. Some things under love could be perverted to be lust. It wasn't until I'm sitting somewhere and said, someone just used that, the f turn of phrase, a lust for power, then my brain was like, oh yeah. Because I didn't want just like lust, like a physical lust, as far as feeling like it needed to be one of these greater devils in the world. But if you break that physical aspect, then it's just lust. Yes, lust physically is part of their purview, what they're over, but other things, this unhealthy pursuit and desire for something that separates what you're desiring from positive reasons for desiring it even just that i was like oh i like that um and then the other groups including the ones from creta are not necessarily bad um they're a lot more neutral and there's i don't know just some wishy-washy things interesting groupings to do deities for um uh, also specifically um there are five gods from Stella. Even though Stella stopped creating much earlier, they created more at the beginning to get these numbers. Five from Stella, five from Krita, and six from Ignis. Also, the devils, I believe, are there five? Yeah, I did five. So there are 21 total. Um, 16 of them are gods. Um, but Ignis has created one more. I don't know. All things and stuff that I'm sure have meaning, even if I don't understand it yet. Now we're almost caught up, because um, next we have idea. An idea, um, of note, this is an idea that came to me while laying in bed, and I just uh, noted them down, like I took out my phone and I spoke an email to myself, and I sent an email to myself to be able to remember it the next day. This was like two or three days ago that that happened. So this has all been stuff over the past like five plus-ish months, but now we're getting to things from just the other day. Um, for the magic items that are modern and use the battery system. So the idea in the world, of course, is you can delve dungeons and find old versions of magic items that work as in the book. But there are also ones that you can find in shops that you have to do arcane batteries for. There is a special cantrip that you can get that will let you pump um, extra spell slots at the end of the day into it to recharge it. Um, if you know this cantrip and you can just give off your extra spell slots but then what if something happens in the night oh no or whatever. so it's still a decision but you can like give off some extra spell slots to recharge these batteries um and I'm, i've been thinking for m many months now because i've known that that's an idea but how does it function and so i'm just laying in bed and my mind keeps working because i'm trying to fall asleep so my mind's like quick come up with as many ideas as you can to distract adam from this sleep thing <laughs> So, for the magic items that are modern and use the battery system, can buy different capacity batteries, um, and every time you put a charge into the battery, roll a d20 or d percentile, and if you get a 1, um, then the max charges goes down by 1. So, let's say it by default this has 25 charges that it can hold. Oh no, I rolled my 1, now it can only hold up to 24. 
and that can keep happening. So eventually your bat you have to replace the battery. So it's not good forever. So just some reoccurring expenses need to be tied to this. Um, this all came, by the way, from I don't like them constantly on a broom of flying. I don't like it. Oh, I have a broom of flying. There is zero reason for me to... I have had players that are like, I never touch the ground. I'm like, oh, are you walking there? What? No, my feet don't touch the ground. I haven't touched the ground in six months since I got that broom of flying. And I'm like, that bothers me thematically in a world. So now there's a cost to it. And if they want to spend the gold or the resources to be that kind of character because that's really who they want to be fine if they want to do it so that there's never a reason for them to step on anything no you have to choose when you're using that don't just make it I'm, i don't like the idea of adam you now have to assume i'm flying 24 7 i don't lay in bed i lay on my broom mmm <laughs> My players are fun, and I love them very much. Where was I? About, uh, so you roll a one, and the max charge goes down by one. Uh, the price of these batteries is exponential as it increases because of that. Because obviously, if you just want a five charge battery, there's a lot of those, because all the big ones eventually become that. Um, and at that point, the people that can afford it are going to want to buy bigger ones, so they'll sell those off for cheaper and that kind of thing. Um, price is exponential uh can use the cantrip to load spell slots into it probably adding one charge per spell level uh, making the higher spell levels more valuable just because they have less die rolls associated i don't have to give like oh you're you're loading a ninth level spell you get 20 points in the battery because that's you know because the power of spell levels are exponential no just the ninth level spell you get nine points with one roll first level spell 1.1 roll, 1.1 roll, 1.1 roll. So it's a lot more rolls to mess up your battery by doing it that way. So that alone makes it where ninth level spell, nine points. First level spell, one point. But each time you get a roll. Um, so that handles that, figuring out how many points you got a lot easier. Um, you're adding one charge per spell level. Uh, making the higher ones less valuable just because they have less die rolls associated. So no need to give extra points for higher levels. Probably have a charge based magic items. And this is probably. So I, I'll have to crunch some numbers and look at magic items more detailed. I might even have to come up with a list where each item has its own entry. It may be needed. But if I don't have to, that would be great. Um, probably have charge based magic items use one battery point per one charge expended. Oh, you, this wand uses three charges for that spell. That's three points. Easy enough. Um, probably have on-use items, such as Broom of Flying. Use one charge every hour or maybe ten minutes. I'll have to look at things, like I said. And maybe have items that are constant and have, uh, have one or uh, five or maybe based on rarity level, number of charges used per day. So if you have an armor, then maybe, you know, you just associate your charges for the day and it it's just good for the day um and that also gave me the or rarity level and i might make all of them rarity level once i came up with that idea i don't know also note items that you and i've, I've mentioned this before items that use this battery charge system um are obviously magical uh, they have materials such as glyphs or magic imbued thread or something like that that goes through them and gives a faint glow. Um, perhaps allow it to be enough to give like a five foot dim light if desired. Like I don't think I'm going to make that by default. Oh, everyone's glowing. But like where if someone is like throwing in a charge, if they want their item to give five foot dim light and make them glow, like that should be like, I'll probably just let that be a free thing. Like, oh, you use the charges for the normal effect. You also get this. Uh, if you want. <laughs> so, um, and therefore they are obviously magic. People, with the modern magic items, one of the things that you lose is the secret I have magic. It's, oh no, your cloak is magical because it has all those glyphs sewn throughout it. Because some items, such as a cloak of invisibility, 
are a lot more useful if not obvious, allow items to be built to use double charges so that while they while in use they are n while in use they are not obvious. Allow item to be uh, or maybe this doesn't work for constant effect items or maybe it makes those constant effect items not constant effect. I don't know. Uh, who knows? Um, but those items are still obvious magic when not having charges being paid for them. As in, your cloak of invisibility is obviously a magical cloak. It has all these glowing lines. You activate it to become invisible. You probably want those lines to go away. It's going to cost double charges if it's built so that that happens, which would likely be how it would be built, right? Um, so double charges, but that way it's not obviously a magic item. Uh, I do note even here, um, of a side note, I think of Cloak of Invisibility not made with this way could still conceal you. It would just be obvious magic threads moving through the air that everyone would know someone was under invisibility there uh, in case that concept were ever useful. So you could probably custom have, like, have a custom made Cloak of Invisibility that, I mean, I don't want to spend double items. It's fine if people notice. That you put it on, you become invisible, and there's just magic glyphs floating through the air where you are. So people, like, so you're not hiding. People would know you're there, but they wouldn't see your face. They wouldn't see who you were. So depending on what your use is, maybe you could save that double charge. Um, but either way, when you're not using it, when it's not active, when you're not paying the charges for it, it's still obviously magical either way. If you want one that isn't, you have to delve through the dungeons and find an old-fashioned version from the old way of making magic items. And then I have idea two. Um, which kind of came to me last night, although uh, I start with, I want halo drops. High altitude, low opening. I have known that for a long time. That's one of the things I've wanted. I, you know, I decided this is a world that has an active war, and there are some limited number of airships involved, and I think, like, I watched something cool on James Bond at one point, and I'm like, I want that! <sighs> so once we get to the war, opposed to magic faction should be able to take airship above magic city in the night, and drop in agents with the anti-magic gas grenades to halt magic within the city. Like, I love this idea of just, like, these people, just this, this small you know, all cloaked in black figures just falling through the sky, no magic, nothing that's being detected, and they open so low that pff, they're not even seen and they're just there. And they're able to start causing chaos as this skyship above the clouds flies away. And they've dropped their agents in, no one the wiser. Oh, it's, it's cool on the, oh, there's a great way to be able to have these spies or you know super soldiers or whatever it is like infiltrate and cause chaos it's also cool for the idea of what if you're have the players play those agents that are dropping into the city that is uh, nifty <laughs> um, but to do that we need rules so uh, I had an idea I think it was last night it's like how to keep it simple because you want to open the parachute, glider, whatever, at the latest possible moment to be least likely to be seen. Um, and so it should just be a dex... And obviously, okay, so dexterity save came to mind. Like, well, yeah. But let the player choose it. Let the person dropping choose what dex save they need to make. The person diving would choose what the DC to, they're going to target is. Um, failure could be disastrous, and maybe depending on how much you fail by it, you might just be obviously seen if you fail by a small amount and splat on the ground by a higher amount. But So maybe you get like, oh, you failed by more than five, you die, uh, or you take whatever, 20d6 or however, whatever the cap is, <clears throat> 20d10 damage from falling. Um, but... If you only fail by five or less, you just, you open, instead of opening too late, you open too early, and you're clearly seen, you know, you, you, <laughs> um, but the DC that you set for yourself is the same perception DC that must be met for anyone to see you, so if you have a lot of bonuses to your deck save and whatnot, and you want to say, I'm gonna go for 28, that's a really high DC, 
basically no one will see. You are waiting literally to the last, you know, 30 would probably be, you know, <laughs> you know, a few feet kind of thing, like near impossible, but you just, and you're there, you know, so 28, you're like real close at the point where you're not just this. <laughs> so real high DC, probably not going to get spotted. So that was just a simple rules idea, we'll call it, for uh, how to how to do a halo drop. Because that sounds like a cool thing to have in the world. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's my notes for like the past five-ish months outside of me working on the map. And some of them I worked on like while also working on the map, but a lot of it has been... Well, I've just been discouraged from getting back to that map. And I will get back to the map. I, I have some ideas, and I think it'll be easier. And that I know more going in from doing it one time to be able to ideally get what I want out of it the second time around. I just gotta get that motivation. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah... I've been rambling a lot, but it has been like five months worth of notes and me also trying to express what I can remember or what I wrote for myself of how I came up with them. And I hope that some of this helps inspire some of you on your own world building or just feel free to rip stuff off. Like if you're like, oh man, Halo Drop sounds perfect for my game. You can just steal what I said. Just use it. Enjoy it and have a fun game. <laughs> Uh, cause that's, that's what our hobby is. It's, you know, you're sitting at your table with your buddies. It's probably for the best. You use whatever you can find to make it the most fun. Um, but yeah. Hopefully, it's not quite as long before the next of these. And hopefully, I've gotten back into doing the map and I'll have that by then. But either way, I'll see you next time I'm, uh, gonna go over what I've been doing to actually build a world. Bye. Thank you.